This backpack is huge. I probably just look like a head in arms and legs. Look at those little donuts. Someone the other day told me they thought I was xenophobic, and I said, I'm not afraid of zines. Please. Can I grab a glass of water? Thanks. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Styrofoam, we don't have that in Portland. I'm gonna find this chili reno in here if it's the last thing I do. I know it's in here. Mm. It's so good though, this burrito. So much better than the Mexican food in Portland. The publishing label started when, I think it was like the fall after I finished school and I was doing these podcasts and a lot of writing is this character, <clears throat> Tanner Dobson, um, which kind of like the guise of a character made me not scared to make it pretty volatile. Looks like a fucking shins video in here. <laughs> All right. My favorite thing is people come by and they go, oh, I've, se I've seen these. And I've seen these. <laughs> that really is my favorite part. <laughs> this guy that I teach with, Victor Maldonado, was curating a show and asked me if I wanted to write a piece for it. The challenge was kind of would I apply my own name to it instead of doing it under this pseudonym. And so the first book that I wrote kind of for the label, which at the time wasn't going to be a label, it was just a zine that I made and it was called Social Malpractice. Kind of like a way for me to vent a little bit, but in this way that was critically engaged and hopefully pretty funny. So it was how to make socially irresponsible art instead of socially responsible art. After like a year or two, I did a book for another artist and then just kind of started to do it more and more and got them into printed matter in New York um, and a few other places. And so it's been kind of a nice, like really simple, way to produce multiples for people that I like and be able to put a lot of artist books really cheaply. When I was in New York, I had a signed copy of The Stand by Stephen King. I signed it and it was a limited edition one of one. I was trying to sell it for only $2.50, which is pretty cheap for a signed edition of one of a book and nobody bit. No one wanted it. I still have it. You know, like as a straight white male performance artist, what's left to be done with my body when Steve-O will staple his nutsack to his leg, like on, on like e-television on the red carpet to somewhere, like, I was just like, what the hell is left to do with the body? And it gave me like a bit of a crisis, so I kind of embraced the comedy aspect more and tried to be more, not intellectual, because most of the comedy is pretty dumb, but more like that, exercising that muscle in the body and seeing how far to push that, but Still, I, I still like to do stunts. Are you ready? Yeah. That was good. That was straight head first, though. That's why I like the turns getting too excited and being like, Woo! <laughs> not huge, but I flip the fuck out is what every dude my size who doesn't know how to fight says about how he fights. There's something about making stuff that has those different layers of accessibility so that there is something for everybody. Like, I don't want the work to be elitist, but I do like that it does require someone to be engaged during the piece. I don't think that it's fair that when I 
make stuff in Futura Bold. All of my designer friends tell me that I have no taste in type, but when Barbara Kruger does it, she's a feminist who makes boring art. There are so many references in like Family Guy that I have no idea what they're talking about, and I just laugh because it's such an absurd. I'm like, who? They're like referencing some weird musical from like the 1950s, and like I'll just start laughing, and I don't even totally understand the reference. I just know that it's funny. So it looks like artist dinners are here to stay. The joke is just telling it in the first place. It's the right. same thing with like the translations that I write, like from English to American. I think the I think if you read them, they're funny, but the whole project, like the idea of it is how stupid it is to translate something from English to American. I'm you. A lot of people don't want their artwork, especially performance, like lined up with entertainment. People want it to be taken seriously. They are kind of opposed to the spectacle of pop culture and all these things. Um, I'm not opposed to having my work likened to that. I enjoy making people laugh, entertaining people, getting people to dance, doing kind of anything that um, shakes them out of their kind of regular experience. My friend does this thing every summer called Hog Fest, and they bury a pig that weighs more than me in their backyard. They have like a rebar, you know, like thing built out underground, which is smoke this pig for like 24 hours. And they take it out and it's all covered in tin foil, and everybody peels it off of it, and they're like ripping the ear and the snout off and just tearing the pig to shreds and eating it. And it's like when things like that happen, it reminds me again of why relational aesthetics is so stupid, because like, People don't need an art context to do something awesome together, like tear a pig to shreds. I'd be, I would go to that. If somebody were doing, if Rick Ritt had a pig roast in a gallery where we all ripped a pig to shreds, I'd be into that. told me I could get an intern through PNCA, through the school, and then they, I had a meeting with the career services department about it, and they told me that um, if I had an intern, they said, where's your studio? And at the time it was in my basement, and I said, it's at my house. And they said, oh, okay, well, then you, you can't work with a gay student or a female student because they can't be alone with you in your home. And so I didn't, I don't want to work with a straight guy. They're difficult. <laughs>